Okay. Uh, can we? Uh, can we now please uh, draw our private conversations to a halt? Uh, this room now has signal, so you can't rely on it being dead, which you used to. So please make sure you're on silent or something discreet. Uh, my name is Connor Geerty. I'm a professor here at LSE, and I am your chair for tonight. Uh, and I have a very simple but lovely job, which is to introduce this person to my left, Martha Spurrier, who is the director of Liberty. Now, Liberty were founded in 1934, looking over, yep. little exam question, yep. I think it was then-ish, <laughs> as the National Council for Civil Liberties. And it has been the key defender of civil liberties in the period since then in this country. And it has reconfigured itself as liberty, but not in a way that detracts from that core mission. It's also, uh, it's also a membership organization. So it is in the best and healthiest, but sometimes annoying sense, a democratic organization. And we're delighted Martha's here, she has a very recent director uh, in succession to Shami Chakrabarti, whom we all know here at LSE, who's a visiting professor in the law department and is a graduate. And so we know the organization through Shami, but we're especially delighted to have here in the law department sponsored lecture, uh, one of the very first outings from Martha as the new, relatively new, four months, I think you can still say new, <laughs> director of Liberty and the topic you'll see there. Before we get to the topic, you will notice, you will notice hashtag LSE Liberty. Now, we are very trendy here and incredibly modern and we want you to tweet uh, this event if you wish with the hashtag LSE Liberty and in an innovation made possible by the Twitter guru who's here in the front, uh, you will be able to tweet a question as well as put your hand up. So if you feel that you want to tweet a question, you may be one of those students who doesn't really, who doesn't really use energy unnecessarily. You could, <laughs> you could tweet the question. And we'll be calling, uh, Bradley will be doing, so you won't get it past him. He's Puritan. He's very, very tough. But if he selects it, he'll catch my eye and we might have that. So we'll have a mix of questions at the end, which are from the audience here, and tweets, and people may be following it uh, on Twitter and they may be able to ask as well. So we try and build up a kind of various sources for our questions. See, Maud's gonna speak now, and then for about half an hour, I think we said, is that right about that? And then we're gonna have lots of time for questions and answers, and then we finish. It'll certainly be before eight o'clock. Eight o'clock's our deadline. Uh, so that's your lot. What an amazing title and how, how pressing to have selected this some weeks ago. Who are we, indeed? Am I we? Are you we? Who is we? Hate, hostility in human rights uh, and human rights in a post-Brexit world. Can we give a big welcome, please, to Mark <laughs> Taylor? Thank you all so much for coming, and thank you to LSE for having me here this evening. When I was studying, I studied history, not law. One of my favorite writers was a man called Benedict Anderson. And in 1983, he wrote a book called Imagined Communities. And in that book, he wrote, I propose the following definition of the nation. It is an imagined political community. It is imagined because the members of even the smallest nation will never know most of their fellow members, never meet them or even hear of them. Yet in the minds of each lives the image of their communion. Communities are to be distinguished, not by their falsity or genuineness, but by the style in which they are imagined. The nation is imagined as a community because 
regardless of the actual inequality and exploitation that may prevail in each, the nation is conceived as a deep, horizontal comradeship. Ultimately, it is this fraternity that makes it possible, over the past two centuries, for so many millions of people, not so much to kill as willing to die for such imaginings. That quote feels as prescient today in 2016 as it probably did in 1983 and did for me when I first read it. Because, of course, we find ourselves embarking on a new chapter in our nationhood and a new national identity. Whether you voted to leave the European Union or to stay in it, and I should say that Liberty as an organisation was neutral on that issue, but whatever your views, recent months have seen upheaval and uncertainty play out in the corridors of power and on our streets. And I wanted to use the time that I have with you this evening to reflect on some of the things that divide us and to offer a framework for the kind of deep horizontal comradeship that could make this imagined national community a tolerant and diverse and equal one. I believe that human rights, which is what I call them, but you might call them ethics, or you might call them morals or values or principles, I believe that human rights can offer that framework. They give expression and form to our better nature. By turning to those values in times of uncertainty, we can guard against intolerance and against division and against hatred. And I think we can ensure that our national identity is not formed as some oppositional reaction to an imagined existential threat, but as a positive, principled vision of the society that we want to be. There are very, very good reasons for looking to human rights to provide a guiding light in times of change. Famously, they protect the citizen from the overweening state, they uphold the rule of law, they promote democratic values, they were written, of course, by some of the greatest legal and political minds in history after the horrors of war and genocide. Over the years, they have been scrutinised and finessed by judges, and they have been endorsed by the civilised nations of the world. They are political, of course, in the sense that they belong in a liberal democracy, but they are not tainted by party politics. They are not beholden to any religion, but nor are they a secular instrument that is incompatible with faith. They are flexible to the operational demands of combat or of policing. They evolve with changing social attitudes, and they operate a constant balancing act between individual freedoms and collective interests. Those reasons, all of them and separately, are more than persuasive enough, I think, to convince even the staunchest sceptic that in human rights we have a value system upon which we can build our communities. But actually, for me, those reasons are not the most compelling ones. For me, the most potent and profound reason for signing up to this whole concept of universal human rights is a much more instinctive one. It shows that the lawyers and the thinkers and the campaigners and the politicians, they're right about why human rights are so good in theory, but that you don't need to be one of those people to deeply understand why human rights are so important. You don't need a law degree, you don't need to have an office in Westminster, you don't need to have written a book, you don't need to have experienced tyranny to really, really know this. When I was practicing as a lawyer a few months ago, and for a number of years, I really began to understand this instinctive cellular understanding of human rights that people had. I learnt that I could walk into a room to meet my client, whether that was bereaved family member, immigration detainee, prisoner, disabled child who needed care in the community, any of those people. I could walk into that room and I knew that we would have something in common. 
Very early on in my career at the bar, I represented a family whose teenage daughter had taken her own life in psychiatric care. There had been a litany of really tragic missed opportunities that in the end had culminated in her needless death. By the end, she was left for over three hours on a ward she'd never been on before, in a state of acute distress and psychosis and fear, and not a single person even said hello to her. Because she was under the care of the state when she died, human rights meant that there had to be a full and fearless investigation into what had gone wrong. It also meant that lessons had to be learned so that vulnerable women like her in the future would not suffer the same tragic destiny. I represented her family because human rights also required that in that courtroom where that inquest would take place, they deserved equal representation to the many state bodies that they were up against. The inquest revealed things that were really shocking and really sad. Records had been falsified, checks had been missed, medication had been withheld. For me, the saddest detail of all was not in the documents or the legal complexities or the battles that we had with the other lawyers, but in the fact that when the paramedics arrived and found her lying on the floor, having been called by the staff on the ward, they turned to the staff, and there were four of them in the room, the paramedics turned to the staff as they were starting to resuscitate her and said, what's this woman's name? And none of the staff even knew. On one of the breaks during that inquest, I sat with this girl's family. I sat with her mum, who was a social worker, and her dad, who worked on the railways, and her brother, who was training to be a police officer. And over a cup of tea, as these conversations usually unfolded, they said to me that when she'd first died, the hospital had said to them, don't worry, we're going to investigate what's happened. And they said to me, we just didn't think that was right. We just didn't think it was right that someone who worked for that hospital should be looking into what went wrong. And of course, in that moment, although they didn't know it, they were articulating the requirement under Article 2 for an independent investigation into deaths where the state may have had a hand in what happened. They went on to say that they had thought, they had hoped, that in that moment, when in her state of profound distress and illness she had been admitted to hospital, they had thought that the professionals had an obligation to protect her and to keep her safe from harm. And of course, they were right about that too, because under Article 2 and under Article 3, professionals do have an obligation to keep vulnerable people safe from harm. And that's whether it's someone on a psychiatric ward, or whether it's a woman who's at risk from a violent partner, or whether it's a kid who's at risk of a racist attack. That was just one conversation of countless conversations that I had with people that hammered home to me that what for me had perhaps been quite an academic path towards understanding why human rights were important resonated much, much more deeply and that people from all walks of life, just like me or just like you and just like anyone, had things happen to them sometimes that were very frightening and very unexpected and very, very unfair. And in those times, very often indeed, the only thing those people had to turn to was human rights. I'm not saying that human rights can deal with your grief or your anger or your sense of mistrust, but they do provide one pathway to seeking some justice. And that's whether you're the Hillsborough families or whether you're the families of young military recruits who have died in unexplained circumstances in barracks, or whether you're the families of people who die in prison or police custody or immigration detention centres. And I challenge anyone, anyone in this room, anyone in our politics, to talk to those families and to not come away with the very strong feeling that human rights are there to protect people when things go wrong and that we diminish and undermine them at our peril. 
So that's why I hope you can understand that when politicians and policymakers play fast and loose with these principles, I find it to be a genuinely grave abdication of their responsibility to us as their citizens. And I believe that there are very real world consequences to their rhetoric and to their policies. During the EU referendum and during the London mayoral race before that, we saw the kind of political rhetoric across the political spectrum that stoked fear and division rather than community and comradeship. And since the EU referendum, as you will all know, we have seen a very frightening spike in hate crime. Importantly, that spike is just the latest in what has been an upward curve for many years of hate crimes against people from BME communities and people who are Muslim. Often under the guise of so-called British values, a phrase so vague that it is hostage to the political prejudice of whoever uses it, successive governments have talked and legislated in ways that demonise and scapegoat the other. Two weeks ago, the Council of Europe was the latest in a long line of analysts and, dare I say it, much impugned experts, to observe the symbiotic relationship between this political rhetoric and the hate-based activity that we are now seeing on our streets. They observed the sharp increase in anti-Muslim violence, the reality for L LGBT students who are facing intimidation, harassment and bullying in their schools and in their colleges every day. They noted the underrepresentation of BME people in the workforce and particularly in the police. They noted the absence of any national strategy for integrating Roma people or any national strategy for integrating refugees. When you add the absence of national thinking about refugee integration to the rhetoric used by the politicians when that crisis was unfolding, words like invasions and floods and swarms, it is no surprise that the UN Special Representative on Migration felt compelled to intervene, accusing our politicians, our politicians who are supposed to be in a civilised, democratic nation, of a xenophobic response to, a cri to the crisis, calling out what they saw as grossly excessive language. It's also no surprise that politicians who are willing to demonise those fleeing persecution do little to check themselves when scapegoating immigrants more generally. I want to be absolutely clear, this is not about immigration policy. It is not about how many immigrants you think, or I think, or Theresa May thinks, or Nigel Farage thinks should come to this country. It is about how we talk about immigrants, and intimately connected to that, it is about how we treat the immigrants that are here. One of the most interesting pieces of polling that was done after the referendum was by an organisation called British Future, which looks at migration and attitudes towards migration in the UK. Unsurprisingly, that polling showed that a lot of people in this country are concerned about immigration. That's the headline, and we all recognise it. But the illuminating and absolutely essential piece of information that they uncovered was that people were concerned about immigration being out of control. What does that mean? That means, when asked, people said that they were concerned that successive governments had made promises about immigration that they couldn't keep. The obvious example being a target that then is grossly overreached. No one, myself included, likes a government to be out of control of anything. You don't want your government to be out of control on immigration or on criminal justice or on the economy. And so, just as you would panic if you saw the breakdown of law and order, just as you would panic if you saw us tumble into a recession, so too you can understand why people panic when they see the government failing to control immigration, failing to meet their own standards that they have set. Because understandably, we assume that our elected representatives set those targets based on an evidence-based analysis of what is achievable. The effect of governments repeatedly failing to meet their targets, 
gives rise to a concern about immigration. They feel like the system is unfair because it is not working. That, I think, is a very understandable thing to feel. But it is also very different, it is radically different, from being anti-immigration or anti-immigrant. I think when you understand that nuance, it suggests that there is an opportunity here. It is an opportunity for policy making that is fair and enforceable, an opportunity for a robust national conversation about what that policy should look like. What has been so genuinely sad to see over the past few months, and what in my view is so profoundly irresponsible, is that this opportunity is being wasted by the government. Rather than take this moment to appeal to our better nature, to advocate for tough policies on immigration, but for compassion and tolerance for the immigrants that are here, the government has continued in a very long and very ignoble tradition, which lies, I have to say, as much at the door of the Labour Party as it does the Conservative Party, of divisive rhetoric and discriminatory policy making. Under David Cameron and continuing under Theresa May, the Conservative Party has introduced a raft of policies to criminalise and penalise and isolate immigrants. Those measures are many and various, but they include making it a criminal offence for an illegal immigrant to drive a car, making it an offence if you don't declare your nationality on arrest, stopping illegal immigrants from being able to rent properties, and using civil orders to prohibit rough sleeping and begging, as well as making swinging cuts to asylum support for those applying for refugee status. And of course, we remember in London those deeply offensive go-home vans on our streets. The government calls this raft of policies the hostile environment policy. After the referendum, hate crime rose by 187%. 80% of those hate crimes were racial hate crimes. We can assume, although this is not recorded as a separate category, but we can assume that many of those that were targeted were targeted either because of their immigration status or because people made assumptions about their immigration status. One thing that this government could do is start recording xenophobic hate crime so that we can understand the true state of hatred against immigrants in this country. During this spike, Amber Rudd, the recently appointed Home Secretary, put out a press release. And in the press release, she condemned in the strongest terms, and I quote, the climate of hostility towards people of different races and different nationalities. Reflect a moment on that language. The government introduces a self-proclaimed hostile environment policy. And months later, the government is forced to come out and condemn hostility towards migrants. You reap what you sow. Language and policy making at the very top, however subconscious, gives license to some people to behave in a way that fundamentally undermines our values. At the rotten heart of all of this is, in my view, one of, if not the most shameful stain on this country's human rights record and treatment of migrants. Not only are migrants routinely demonised in our laws and our policies, but over 31,000 of them every year are detained for administrative convenience. Let's be very clear about what this is. These immigrants are not serving a criminal sentence. Their detention has not been authorised by a judge. Most of them, for the entire time that they are detained, will never see the inside of a courtroom. They are held there, that's over 31,000, that's about a third of our entire prison population. They are held there simply for the administrative convenience of the executive. They include pregnant women, they include children, 128 of them last year. They include people with very serious mental and physical disabilities. They include victims of torture, victims of rape, victims of trafficking. The single biggest group of people who are held in immigration removal centres are people who have or are seeking asylum. 
In recent years, some light has been shone on the horror of the immigration detention estate. Unannounced inspections and investigative journalism has shown that these centres fail to meet the most basic standards of safety and respect. I had times as a barrister when I was doing these cases where I would stand up in court and practically plead for the same standards that we see in our prisons. We have seen incidents of unlawful and fatal use of restraint, denial of basic and essential medical treatment, detainees being referred to by their guards as animals, filthy and overcrowded conditions, and allegations of sexual abuse. Since 2010, there have been six cases in which a breach of Article 3 has been found by the High Court or the Court of Appeal here. So that's six cases where detainees have been treated in a way that is inhuman and degrading by the state. In no other area in this country do we have or would we tolerate such terrible ill treatment. These human rights violations are, of course, of the gravest order, but they are also largely under the radar. And I think that one of the reasons for that is because of the permissive approach taken to xenophobia at the highest level. In one case, a detainee, he's called HA, the detainee was so floridly psychotic and distressed that he began drinking from the toilet. He would sit naked in his cell and drink from the toilet bowl. A human rights case was brought on his behalf and one of the parts of his claim was that there had been a breach of his Article 3 rights, that he had been treated in an inhuman and degrading way because he was so ill that he should have been taken to hospital. The barrister for the Home Office said that drinking from the toilet was not a sign of mental illness because in Nigeria, where this man was from originally, drinking from the toilet was normal, as was defecating and urinating in the same place that water for drinking, cooking and washing was drawn. That was a submission made in seriousness by a senior barrister just across the road in the Royal Courts of Justice on behalf of the government. It's a racist submission and the government should be ashamed that it was ever made on its behalf. So the human price we pay for immigration detention is exceptionally high and it doesn't work either. It fails repeatedly to deliver the enforcement gains that the government seeks. Last year, over a thousand people were detained for more than six months, and many are detained for several years. One of the inspection reports found someone, again, profoundly mentally ill, too mentally ill to know that they could apply for bail, who had been in detention for six years. 60% of the people in detention are released without being removed to their home country which of course renders the entire process utterly pointless. And it costs in the region of 76 million pounds a year. Plus, in the time 2010 to 2014, the government had to pay out 15 million pounds in compensation because they had unlawfully detained and ill-treated detainees. There are alternatives. There are many examples from across the world of countries who do not administratively detain immigrants. So in Sweden, for example, they use intensive case management and they engage with individuals in the community. And as a result, they have exceptionally low rates of detention and very high rates of people voluntarily returning to their home countries. Unsurprisingly, you might think, preserving people's dignity and enabling them to understand their case increases their trust and confidence in the system and makes everything work better. By contrast, you might think, an enforcement strategy that is centred on long-term incarceration can only foster hostility and polarisation. So standing back, taking a look at the hostile environment and the hate crime and the pitiful response to the refugee crisis and the indefinite administrative detention of immigrants, and the lack of any integration strategy, and the recent proposal to raise immigration tribunal fees by 500%, is it any wonder that when people were asked at the end of this summer how they felt about their communities, they said that they felt more divided than ever? 
None of this is about party politics, and none of it, really, is about whether we are in or outside the EU. It is much more fundamental. It is about our values, our capacity for compassion and tolerance and fairness, and our ability, each and every one of us, to hold the powerful to account and to respect one another. It's about the kind of imagined community that we want this nation to be, and the very, very real risk that our representatives, right in front of our eyes, are doing away with the deep horizontal comradeship that makes this nation a civilised one. Perhaps the starkest and the worst example of all of this is that the government continues repeatedly to reaffirm its commitment to repealing the Human Rights Act. The Human Rights Act, as many of you will know, makes the European Convention on Human Rights part of UK law. In legal terms, it is a document that enshrines the rights you would expect to see in any civilised democracy, drafted after the horrors of the Second World War, ironically by conservative lawyers. For everyone else, what it is, is just a very simple treatise of fairness and equality and compassion. And contrary to what the politicians would have you believe, the Human Rights Act is not toxic and it's not dangerous and it's not even unpopular. The Conservative Party themselves did some polling on the Human Rights Act a couple of years ago and it found that there are 20% of people who are dead set against it. That there are 20% of people who are very, very much in favour of it. And that there are then 60% of people who don't really know what it is. My experience with clients, with friends, with distant relatives who don't share my politics, is that when you explain what the Human Rights Act is, when you tell them the values that it codifies into law, they get it instinctively and they want to protect it. It's the same instinctive feeling that I saw in my clients and it's the same instinctive feeling that I have in myself and it's why I applied for this job in the first place. So for me, the very first step in the foothills of this very big national conversation about our identity is that we must stand together to protect the Human Rights Act so that in doing that, we protect the values that we hold dear and we hold our representatives to those values. I think we can resist succumbing to the hostility and the hate, and I think, and I feel hopeful, that we can be the kind of nation that doesn't have a British Bill of Rights for British people, but has a Human Rights Act for all people, because we believe in universal human rights, because we're compassionate and we're fair and we're principled, and we are proud of it. Thank you. fascinating uh, uh, at a number of levels and we have time to unpick it a bit. I'm going to start uh, and then I'm going to look around and we're going to check whether we have any tweets uh, and try and catch my eye. But one thing that struck me, you start by saying, I didn't cover this at the start, but you read history and then you moved to law mm -hmm. and I, I think, did you have a feeling, oh, to get anything done in the field of human rights you need to be a lawyer? You know, there's this, and running through that talk there's a kind of creative tension between court, you were at Dowdy Street, before that worked public law projects, so on. Uh, human rights as law, achieving change, but then also with human rights as social movement. Mm -hmm. So you, it, losing the case doesn't necessarily mean that the human right has been vind not vindicated. It, it's a social movement as well, and that's what you're talking about at the end. Which, is it possible to do human rights without law, do you think? Or is law an integral part of and a leader in the field of human rights? I don't think you can do human rights without the law, because in the end, the law is your last refuge if nothing else works. I think in the human rights utopia, you would have a human rights act, but you'd never need to use it. Um, but I don't think you would ever be so foolish as to take it away. 
I absolutely think human rights has to be a social movement. I think one of the reasons why the Human Rights Act in this country is now vulnerable is because we don't have... You talk to Americans about how they feel about the Constitution. They are they are passionately loyal to it. And politicians in America, perhaps leaving some unnamed individuals aside, have, have in their minds the constraints that the, con that the Constitution puts upon their power and, and by and large accept that those constraints need to be there. Similarly, in European countries that have a history of, of tyranny, they also understand that having checks on executive power is important. We don't have that narrative so much, I think, in this country. Um, and I think the Human Rights Act had a pretty bumpy start. Very rapidly after it was introduced, 9-11 happened, and that changed the dialogue so radically. And it's now labelled as Labour's Human Rights Act, and it's been dragged through the mud of party politics, and it's a useful thing for conservative politicians to use to say it's all about paedophiles and rapists and terrorists. Um, I think unless we have a social movement, it will always be vulnerable. Yeah, thank you. Thank you much, very much. Fascinating. Uh, right. Questions? Anybody got any questions? Anybody got uh, any hand up? Inaugurate the question and answer session. We've got a gentleman here. Sir, you're our guinea pig. You are standing up, which is an innovation. Uh, you please give us your name, if you, if you wish, and if you feel able to. And then a brilliant thing would be a succinct question preceded possibly by a short observation, but mainly a question and mainly succinct. <laughs> I think it's going to be difficult to do all of that. But my name's John Hintzer. I am a long-standing member of Amnesty, and my uh, interests politically, uh, you, you might guess from the question that comes. Uh, human rights, in a sense, in the UK, is a bit of a political football. And, of course, the political system in the UK, where except in the time of war, the idea of having a coalition of all the parties to work together to a common objective, winning a war. Do you think that there could be any benefit if those politicians who talk about we're all one nation, we're all in the same boat, and all those other cliches, if they could actually be persuaded to move towards a coalition where common values that are accepted by everyone then take over. Thank, thank you, John. Uh, I'm thinking about taking one or two others. Do we have any of this side moving across? We have two over here with a remarkable upsurge of enthusiasm. <laughs> we'll take the uh, lady right at the Oh, it's going to the gentleman. Sir, could you say who you are, ask the question, and then hand it to the lady there, and then we'll do some answers. Uh, hello, my name is Charlie. I'm a master's student at LSE. My question is, is quite specific, and it's about what Liberty is going to be doing to campaign on the protection of the human rights that we see protected by EU law. And I'm thinking of things like the 2011 Trafficking Directive that protects victims of trafficking because the UK law is absent many protections that that provides. I'm thinking of other protections protect, protected by EU discrimination law. Is Liberty going to be campaigning to make sure that those are protected post-Brexit? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Charlie, and handing the microphone down. Thank you. Hello, my name is Michelle. I'm a student in UCL, and I was wondering that all those human rights action that's supposed to be done, it does not like. It, it, comes, it does not come without costs. There are still costs. There are limited resources. How are you going to solve all of this? Thank you, Rita. Do you want to take those? Um, yeah, Martha? sure. Great. OK, so um, John's question, political football, I think that's absolutely right. Human rights, like many things, are a political football. Would I like there to be a future where there is a coalition of representatives who all agree on basic values and then work towards them? Yes, that to me is like my dream. Do I think it is likely in the short or medium term? No. I, I want to be optimistic about it. I think, I think if, if there is enough social pressure, I'm a firm believer, and it's why I talk about the importance of a social me movement, if outside of Westminster, people are saying, we do not give you permission to talk in this way or act in this way, and actually what we want from you is to be principled, 
that is the biggest possible steer you can ever give an elected representative to behave differently. So I think if we can in some way have a social movement and have some agreement about the basic things that we think are important as a nation, then that's going to be the best way for making the politicians align themselves around those values. Um, I feel hopeful that that's maybe going to be part of the conversation over the coming years, but I also feel worried because I don't think we've seen a great deal of evidence of that from this government in recent months. Um, quick answer to the question about Brexit and the answer is yes. Um, so, like I say, Liberty was neutral on the outcome of the referendum, but firmly believes that any leaving of the EU needs to be fair and just, and that the result of the referendum does not signify a mandate to diminish rights protection. So we are pursuing a project where we, we will map out the areas where we stand to lose rights protection, and then go on the front foot to say to politicians, these are the red lines and you must not undermine them, and that's trafficking, it's asylum, it's workers' rights, it's torture regulations, um, victims' rights, there's a whole range of areas, so yes. And then the question about limited resources, which I think is a really valuable one. Um, the whole point about human rights, whether you look at how they work in the context of policing or healthcare or on the battlefield, is that they are designed to be flexible. So there are some absolute rights that you can never transgress, like the right not to be tortured. But the majority of them are qualified. And that's what I mean when I say that they are in constant dialogue, balancing individual interests with community interests. So for example, the police are under an obligation to investigate crime because of the Human Rights Act. But that obligation is caveated by the fact you can't impose, and this is the word the judges use, an unreasonable burden on the police. So you can expect them to investigate effectively within their powers and within the resources that they have, but you don't hold them to a standard which is impossible for them to meet. And that's in many ways the frustrating thing around the human rights narrative is that they are not portrayed as an operational tool for public servants. Actually, if you talk to a lot of public serv servants, talk to nurses, talk to police officers, they find human rights provides them with a framework for decision making and also provides them with a hard and fast reason to go to their superiors or those who draw up their budgets to say, I have an obligation here to investigate rape effectively. That means we need to have a dedicated team in this police force so that we can do that. Otherwise, those pesky lawyers might be after us. And that is an advocacy tool for public servants as much as it might end up being an advocacy tool for victims. Uh, we're, we're going to go around to you guys in a minute, and I've already a gentleman has caught my eye here. But I have to ask, why was Liberty neutral on Brexit? Because the European Union, through the Charter of Rights, guarantees rights, the uh, gender discrimination laws and maternity rights and so on, rooted in European law, tremendous advances in the field of racial discrimination. Uh, it, was it a problem? I mean, it may have been before your time, Martha, but it seems to me quite extraordinary. We could be so strong about the Human Rights Act. And, and relaxed about the loss of these rights, which would follow the Brexit decision. Was it a it, I mean, difficult it, choice? It was happened? a decision before my time, so yeah. I, can't, I can't speak to the sort of dialogue that went on when the decision was made. But I think it was a wise decision because, firstly, the Human Rights Act and the Convention, of course, are not related to the European Union, much as those two things are allied in the press and by politicians. And so foundationally where we get our human rights protection in this country is from the Human Rights Act and the Convention because the Charter of course only applies when EU law is being applied and that actually is a relatively narrow sphere. Um, also the way that Brexit was being argued was not about rights. So there wasn't had Brexit been presented as a way to diminish rights protection, then Liberty would have taken a position. But it wasn't ever, and that's why we can now say there is no mandate in this referendum result to diminish rights protection. It was much more a conversation about immigration policy and about the economy and many, many other things. And, and those issues are just simply not issues that Liberty works on. Yeah, thanks. Good. Sir, uh, there should be a microphone very close to you. Anybody else? Here? <coughs> this gentleman here. Good evening. Thank you for your talk, Martha. My question is as, as follows. Um, um, being a bit devil's advocate in some ways against the Human Rights Act, it's not the act itself or many of the clauses, but some of the clauses that concern me. So feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, but I do understand that a 
one of the protocols might be something like the right to education. Now, taking that as an example of a human right gives me some kind of concern because if we look at sort of, say, the late Isaiah Berlin's view of freedom or as a negative concept, the right to education is a right to say that something has someone does something for them as opposed to a lack of interference, as an example, that they mustn't be interfered with, which is sort of a concept of torture. If somebody has a right to education, then that means that you are forcing somebody else to pay for that education in some way. <coughs> and if somebody else is paying for that education, you could argue that, that is an infringement on their liberty. And I'm just wondering about what your views is, is, is you know, from some of these points of view as well. So thank you. Okay, great. Thank you very much. And I'm in the market for, yes, madam. So we have you, sir, with the microphone, and then this lady here, and we'll take another group. And I've got you at the back, sir, for the next round. Yes. Name, Hi. please, and question. I'm Tom Hooksma. I'm a GDL student at University of Law across the road. Um, and I was going to ask about the access to the law. Um, last night, I was at the 40th birthday of the Southwark Law Centre, and I started practicing in street law back in the 1980s, um, this kind of uh, active law when there wasn't much availability of legal aid and so on. We're obviously in a world where legal aid is getting absolutely destroyed, and of all the rights we're losing, it's the right to representation, access to legislation for whatever your area is or whichever area of your human rights are being infringed, whether it's by the police or because of your sexuality, because of who you are or the color of your skin, and nobody's getting access to the law and the whole law courts are getting clogged up. And if we look, example, at the moment, the Birmingham pub bombings and the fact that you know that's still going on, and I won't call them the Birmingham six victims because I think that's inappropriate. We've been through that road, but these people still have no justice that's come to them for the 27-odd victims who died and the 100 or so victims who were injured in that bombing. And there's no legal aid being presented there. And the Home Office, again, the Prime Minister, stood up in, in uh, PMQs today and told a blatant farcical lie. She actually said um, that the, um, oh, they can apply for legal aid and I'm sure it'll be looked at. Well, they've been turned down by legal aid already as not qualifying. How do we, as, let's be honest, some of the people in this room, most of the people in this room, hope to be lawyers or are lawyers and hope to earn a good living from it, how do we ensure that we actually give access to the rest of society rather than just those of us who can afford it? Great. Thanks, Tom. And if you, having rescued the mic, can come down, and then there's a lady here who's on your left who's now got the microphone. Hi. Um, my name is Marie. I'm training to be a lawyer, and I'm also a Liberty member. Um, I was just wondering, it seems to me that the, the press, and the newspapers, national newspapers, have as much of an impact, if not more of an impact on um, opinion than the government. And I was wondering if, if you thought um, they should be held accountable just as much as the government, and if that would be part of liberty's mandate. Um, thanks. Thank you, Ray. Uh, I think that's enough to be going on with. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So the right to education, so I understand the conceptual thrust behind your question, and I will get to that, but just to be clear, there is no enshrined right to education in the Human Rights Act. So that is one of the protocols of the Convention, but it's not enforced in this country. Um, so that, I would say, the right to education, along with rights such as the right to healthcare, fall perhaps more into the category of socioeconomic rights, which we don't really have in the UK. But I think your question is a broader one, which is this balance between so-called negative liberties and positive liberties, positive freedoms or entitlements. Um, I have to say I think it's a false distinction. I think that when you actually understand how these rights work, defining them as simply negative rights doesn't capture what they do in society. So a classically negative right is the right to protest. You are negatively allowed to go out and protest about animal rights, as long as you're peaceful. And that is probably one of the most core civil libertarian types of rights from history. But actually, protest when it is controversial, so let's move, say, from animal rights to you want to protest against a far-right group, when it's really controversial, it doesn't happen neatly uh, or peacefully. And say that the far-right group find out that you want to go and protest against them, and they decide to turn up and do a counter-protest. 
And at that point, you've got one group of people passionately anti the far right and one group of people passionately pro the far right. And you've potentially got a public order problem. And what the right to protest then does, because it's a dynamic right, is it says to the police, within your resources that are available to you, you must do your absolute best to facilitate both protests. Because both of these people have an equal right to express their views. But there is a risk that one is going to be prevented from doing so by the other. So in that circumstance, and it happens all the time with protests, the police police the protest to make sure that the groups of protesters are kept safe. That is a positive right. That's an obligation on the police to do that. Now, there are many examples when the police say, actually, it's too dangerous and it's too resource intensive, so we can't do it, so we can't allow your protest to take place. But the point about the right to protest is that it says you can only stop the protest if it's necessary and proportionate to do so. So that makes your average police officer say, OK, do I really have to say to you, you cannot protest against this far right group because I'm worried they're going to come and beat you up? Well, no, because it's legitimate that I should put two police officers next to you to make sure you're all right. Now, maybe two is justified, maybe 20 is justified, maybe 500 isn't justified. And, and then the line gets drawn. And the conversation you always have with human rights is, where's the line? So. I don't think that positive negative line is is one that actually reflects how human rights work in practice. And it's the same, for example, with the right to life. You know, we have there is a negative right not to have your life taken from you unlawfully by the state. But what do you do when you're talking about people in psychiatric care who are very, very vulnerable, where professionals should be able to, to accurately ex- assess their risk of suicide and should then take steps to protect them from that risk? Again, that arguably, that's the negative right. You're being protected from, from death, and that's your right. But it slides quite quickly into being something more positive. And again, I think you can't have one without the other. Um, access to justice. I mean, I agree with you. I think, the, I think the state of legal aid in this country is deeply impoverished. I think LASPO had a devastating effect on access to justice. I think it is having human and economic costs, which are very difficult to measure, but undoubtedly profound. I think it's particularly impacting the most vulnerable. I think it's particularly impacting single mothers and prisoners and people who are on benefits and people who are in debt and people who need local authority housing. And that is a class of people who tend not to occupy positions of power. They tend not to have the ear of the press. And so they are disenfranchised from every angle. I don't think there's any prospect of this government putting more money into the legal aid system. And I think it's very, very hard for legal aid lawyers to make ends meet. And I don't think that pro bono from corporate law firms, helpful as that is to a degree, I don't think that's an answer. I don't think we know what the answer is yet. And my fear is that it has to get very, very bad indeed before it will get better. I think it will have to reach crisis point before the politicians are obliged to do something. Um, But all I can say is that I agree with you. I think it is it is a real problem in this country that we do not have adequate access to justice. And the Birmingham pub bombings, those families are one example, you know, of justice delayed and justice therefore being denied. The press. So. I agree with you that there are sections of the press that write things that are inflammatory and prejudiced and often wrong. And it's right that the press should be held accountable. And in the way that you can hold your government to account by not voting for them, you can hold your media to account by not buying their papers or going on their website. Um, And it's right that the press should be regulated. And it's right that we should have laws about defamation defamation and contempt of court. And then, of course, it's also right that we should have free expression. The reason that this is not a priority area for liberty is that in the end, what human rights are about, and therefore what liberty is about, is policing the relationship between the citizen and the state. And so that is not to say that terrible things don't happen in the press or by individual private actors or by big corporates or whatever it is but because we are in the business of human rights that means we are in the business of public bodies and how they treat individuals thank you martha uh two 
two, two men have caught my eye, and a third maintaining a degree of gender balance has caught my eye. Now, so we have three more. We start with the gentleman whom I ignored last time, right at the very top, with his hand almost gesticulating in enthusiasm. The microphone is being rushed to you, sir. Name, question, and then we take the gentleman whom I, of course, know, but will say who he is in the normal way, and then we have the lady whose hand is back up. Sir. Uh, hello. My name is Ian. My question is regarding a British Bill of Rights. Um, people have often uh, tagged both Brexit and the rise of Trump in the US as a sort of um, reaction against globalism, um, globalization. Um, do you think, in those circumstances, the fact that we have a European convention is in itself a problem? Obviously, uh, it's nothing to do with the EU, but it is, a, it is an European in in instrument. Um, do you think that actually the best way to protect human rights in this country might be to drape it in the, in the potentially false flag of nationalism and a British Bill of Rights would actually help to do that rather than leave it vulnerable as a European instrument? Uh, thanks, Ian. I mean, there are some people who really regret that the schedule has the European Convention and wasn't called the Bulldog <laughs> British Rights. <laughs> and at the end, nothing to do with those people on the continent. People do regret that. Uh, the microphone to the gentleman who is about to say who he is and ask a question. Joe, not to give the game away, excitement. <laughs> Thank you, Connor. Um, Joe Merkins from the Law Department. Um, you said that freedom of protest was a uh, core civil liberty, but it's um, rival, it faces strong competition from free speech. <laughs> and since you gave a talk at, at a university today, I was wondering whether what stance Liberty took on speech codes at university. Now, you might say, OK, you're interested in the relationship between individual and the state, and therefore Liberty doesn't take a stance. But do you take a stance in a personal capacity? Thank you, John. Nice little second bit of that question. <laughs> Anticipating the cross-ex intervention. And this lady here. Uh, the microphone is now coming towards you. Name, affiliation, if you have one, and want to give it, and question. Uh, my name is Grace, and I'm a civil servant. Um, so you mentioned at several points during your talk that you have a desire to return to a British nation after all of the hostility. So many argue that the very construction of a nation requires comparison to an other. So in your view, how do you reconcile the desire for an inclusive community at the individual level, um, for individual experience, with the nation's existential demand for discriminating at a national level. Thank you very much. Uh, Martha, in whatever order you okay, wish. Okay, I'm going to start with the philosophical one. That's so, okay. yeah. yeah, I mean, God, there's been a lot written about what makes a nation. Fukuyama absolutely believes that you make a nation only by having oppositional forces and therefore that it's inherently always going to be not just about discrimination but Fukuyama believes it's always going to be about conflict and the reason I started with the Benedict Anderson quote is because I think that is a different vision about how you can create community um, I don't believe that the only way to create a nation is by discriminating I think, of course, if you're going to go in for nation states, and there's a whole other conversation about whether that's a valid concept at all in the 21st century, and as Ian said, in the global world, but if you're going to go in for that, then you are going to have to find ways that define your nationhood, and that's going to be the nature of your democracy, and it's going to be the kind of economy you choose to have, and it's going to be your immigration policy. I think what my point is, is that within all of that, you don't have to compromise your values. So you can have a robust immigration policy. You can have an isolationist economic policy. You can have all of these tenets of nationhood, which will be debated and formed in the usual way for us in the way of parliamentary democracy. None of those things mean that you should decide to disavow equal treatment or the prohibition on torture. I, I don't see that those two things are intention. Now, what is intention is having a separation of powers and where you say the executive are going to be bound by a certain set of rules and values, which then the judiciary are going to enforce, and that's always going to be a tension. But I don't, I don't think that there's a tension between having aspirational values and being a nation state. Um, and that's, that's why I think it is irresponsible politics and often just lazy politics 
to suggest that that's what you need to do. I think it, I think it whips people up. You know, fear is a great motivator. Um, and I think if you want to play to people's fear and you want to play to their sense of insecurity and threat, you will always be able to find something that people are frightened of. And what I would hope from people who take elected office is that they decide that there are other ways to have that conversation, more nuanced ways. Um, and I don't think we see a great deal of that at the moment. So free speech. So I, sh- I should say, sadly, I'm not really allowed to talk about things in a personal capacity anymore. Um, I knew that. Checkmate, You Marcus. totally, totally knew that was coming. Um, I suspect you could guess that lots of my opinions are not very different from liberties, but, um, but if and where they do diverge, I would not uh, use this space to articulate them. I would do it in the pub with my friends. <laughs> um, so I think the free speech issue and the no platforming and all of those debates, firstly, the caveat is there's a case-by-case basis situation that of course has to happen and so in the same way that we talk about protests we say if you're going to have someone come and speak at your university that who is going to cause riots that are unmanageable or is going to in some way transgress the university's values or so alienate and discriminate against a group of the people who are there such that they don't feel able to occupy that space there may be a case for saying we're not going to invite this person to come and speak Um, but on balance I don't think that no platforming works because I don't think that the way of having human rights standards is to try and deprive other people of their human rights. I think what we can try and do within the confines of what I've just explained is say we are big enough and strong enough for you to come and air your offensive views. I mean, Article 10 gives you a right to be offensive, to shock people, to disturb people. It doesn't give you a right to incite hatred. To me, that is a principled line, and that's the line that you draw when you're talking about how to manage any kind of speaking event, whether it's in a university or in Trafalgar Square or in Speaker's Corner. Does that answer your question, sort of? Oh, don't risk asking don't, him no, that. No, that, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> and I think there was Ian on the European, Yes, wasn't so the false flag of nationalism. I mean, I think it's right, as Connor says, that there are some people who kind of think, well, if only we just called it the British Human Rights Act at the beginning, maybe we wouldn't be having this conversation. I think we probably would be having the conversation because I don't think it is just about nationality. I think it is also about paedophiles and rapists and prisoners who supposedly are allowed to have pornography in their cells because of Article 8. You know, all of these things are pretty much made up. Um, But I, I don't think it is just about these EU laws that are made by Europeans who we don't like. I also don't think that we should be hanging a false flag around anything. I think we should be able to have a conversation about the values that we hold dear and aspire to. And one of those things has to be that we believe in universal human rights. And the problem is, some people talk about, oh, it would just be a name change, it would be a facelift, just call it the British Bill of Rights. But actually, what signal does that give to people that are here that aren't British? What signal does it give to other countries who we want to uphold rule of law standards, like Russia? What signal does it give to our enemies who love to try and have the moral high ground against us and we would basically be giving it to them? So I think it is more profound than just saying, well, let's just put nationalism around it and hope that everyone will swallow it. There is a bigger conversation that has to happen about whether we accept these values. I believe that people do accept them. And I don't think that by saying, oh, well, maybe you'll accept them if we use the word British. I don't think that's what concerns people. Like I say, my experience is that if you sit people down and explain what these values are, they understand it and they don't come back and say, well, hold on a second, I think that should only be for British people. We have a number of hands going up now and I'm going to look for a bit of gender balance because I have three men who've caught my eye during the talk, which we're going to come to, uh, uh, we're winding down, we're running out. So are there any uh, women who might want to ask questions? Have a think about that. While I call- we, have, we have various women pointing out other women. There's been, <laughs> there's been a That's major like development in gender solidarity here. <laughs> so we have this lady here, but we, we'll hold her back for a minute, if you don't mind, and we'll go to this gentleman who was elected by his friends to ask a question. Is that right, sir? <laughs> and then we'll go to you, sir, whom I, of course, know, and then we'll come to you. So these three, and then we'll come to you if we have time, if we have time. 
Uh, name, yes. To, to Thank you. Uh, my name is Tony. Um, Who is it? I'm sorry. This is oh, it's you. You yeah. asked. Oh, you got your Thank mate you. to put his hand up. My goodness, you. Both tried of us wanted to ask a question. What's your name? And uh, <laughs> Tony. Um, um, your predecessor actually came to our school earlier this year, and um, we had a conversation about what it meant to be British. Mm -hmm. um, and so, in your capacity as a historian and not a lawyer, I was wondering, um, what do you think it is um, specifically about Britishness as a, a cultural identity or national history? which makes it appear to certain people that xenophobia is a British value or patriotic action. What is it that makes people see that that is an acceptable form of um, behaviour? Uh, Tony, thank you very much. Uh, the next question is running around in excitement. So the chap running back and forth, <laughs> whom I know will now will ask to say who he is and ask the question, another law colleague. Yes, Jan Klanheister came from the law department as well. Um, I have a question regarding... Um, the disparity between the idea of the government planning to get out of the European Convention of Human Rights on the one hand, which means UK citizens should not be allowed to have international rights defined by a treaty and access to an international jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. and at the same time, in a few days, the, it is the same government which in the Council uh, will vote for the EU signing and Britain signing CETA, the trade agreement with Canada, which in other things, provides precisely for international rights of protection for foreign investors and an international jurisdiction for adjudicating that. How, how do we make sense of that? If, if we can. Thank you, Jan. And finally, yes, uh, but you're going to wait for a microphone, which is being brought down. Thank you very much for being volunteered by others. And name and question, please. Thank you. Hello, my name is Sandy, and I'm not a lawyer. I'm just a simple person. Um, <laughs> just a I human being. I was used for over 15 years by Oxford City Council, and my question is a personal one. Um, I wanted to know that the, there's a, if you're a landlord and you have a dispute and someone doesn't pay their rent and threaten to beat you up and then you have an argument with them, um, and you go to court and they convict you of criminal offence for telling them, one day you will F off out of my house, please leave me alone, I have a three-month-year-old baby. Um, and they convict you of a criminal offence for saying that. Um, and then all bad landlords in England, they put you on a list. Is that a defamation of character? Is that fair from a human rights point of view? Because I don't think it is. I think it's a 100% a abuse of housing someone when you're pregnant and you don't choose not to sign on the dole but house someone and then you get into a dispute because they don't pay their rent. It's a very personal one, but there's loads of landlords out there who are beaten up, abused, beaten with sticks, threatened to have their houses burnt down, text messages that we're going to blow, blow up your car, four o'clock in the morning, unbearable nonsense. And yet, you're, they put your name on a list. But that makes you feel like a paedophile mm. because they put their names on a list. Is that fair? I don't understand human rights. I just know I need to ask the question. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much for, for intervening. But those are three. We might get this gentleman whose hand was up earlier, but we're beginning to run out of time. But not hugely, but those three. Okay. Um, can I just make sure that I understand your question? You, it's two things, I think. One is, do human rights play some part when you're the victim of abuse? And the second is about being named or the state putting you on a list and your name and your identity being in some way branded. Is that, is that a fair summary? Yeah. 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 So I don't know the specifics of your case. I know that's a kind of classic lawyer thing to say, but it's true. Um, but it doesn't sound fair to me. Um, and it doesn't, I mean, obviously, I don't think that anyone should be the victim of any abuse. And of course, the criminal law can be a blunt instrument. And there are very many examples. Um, and domestic violence, in fact, is one of the prime examples where this happens, where the wrong people get criminalized. Um, and so it does sound like you have had a very unfair experience. Um, it sounds, and again, I would say this because I'm a lawyer, it sounds like you should maybe talk to a lawyer. 
if you can access one. Um, then there's a kind of separate issue of people being kept on lists, and that's a huge concern, and that's a concern across the board, and it's been a real concern throughout the passage of the Investigatory Powers Bill, which is this bill that's currently going through Parliament, which seeks to codify how the government and local authorities and the police are allowed to take your data, keep your data, use your data, so whether that's your identity or your internet history or whatever. Um, and I think it's absolutely right that there is real mission creep on this issue and that many people find themselves on lists. I was talking to someone today who um, does animal rights protesting and found out the other day when she tried to go to one of the party political conferences that she's on the domestic extremist list. Um, she's never been convicted of any criminal offence, she just has gone on a lot of protests. So I think that is a, a trend that we are seeing and I think in many of the individual cases it isn't a fair or proportionate thing to be done and it should be challenged and, and that's why I say that if you can get some advice about both of those things, it sounds to me like you need it because they do sound unfair. Um, so Tony's question about Britishness. So I think one of the reasons why I started with that Benedict Anderson quote about imagined communities is that I do believe that nation states are kind of imaginary. Um, in the way that you choose where you're going to draw your border, not because the earth was formed with a border on it, but because that's where you're going to draw your border. Um, and so in a way, that presents a great opportunity to proactively define what a nation's values are going to be. And so you can say, what we believe is that British people or Britishness is fairness or tolerance or the right to free expression and you can draw those things from history and we do have a very long history of respecting civil liberties in this country a very long history of democracy no real history of tyranny so there's plenty of material on which you can draw on to to build up this idea that actually being british is about aspiring to and holding those values um, but of course you can do the complete opposite and say well actually being british is being white or speaking English or being Christian and and that's where nationhood and identity becomes quite complex because a bit like the idea of British values which genuinely I have no idea what that means I don't think the politicians have any idea what that means but boy is that phrase used to criminalize and penalize people and often what it means is dissenters often it means people who are not within the majority status quo I think the ideal definition of Britishness is something that basically says we accept people that are not part of the status quo and so we don't have a closed definition of Britishness. We are liberal and we are tolerant and that means you can never even foresee the categories of things you might have to tolerate um, and you draw the line at violence. You draw the line at people who abuse other people's human rights, but you accept that people are allowed to have extreme views. You accept that people are allowed to be offensive. You accept that rubbing along with your fellow man or woman isn't always going to be that comfortable. But in the name of the greater good, you say we're going to try to get along and respect each other. And we are at least going to expect the state, of course, the state with the monopoly of force and control and coercion, that the state will at least respect you. That's the kind of that's my penny for a thought about what Britishness is, but I don't, I don't think there is a definition. Um, the Convention and International Treaties. So I think there isn't really a rationale to why we should sign up to, I mean, many, many, many international treaties. We have ratified so many international treaties on human rights, most of which we don't really do anything to comply with. And part of the reason we do it is because we want other people to sign up to them. And there's a kind of diplomatic effort there. Um, and the European Convention is just one of them. And it just happens to be the most enforceable one because we've incorporated it into UK law. I think there is a very real problem when you have a prime minister who says she doesn't want to be part of the European Convention. And I should say, I think that's, that's actually something that doesn't get a lot of attention. But it wasn't just before she took on being prime minister that she said... Theresa May said she didn't want to be part of the convention. She did an interview with Sky News during the Tory conference when she was asked her views about the convention, and she said, quote, I'm not a great fan. And I, I think I'm right in saying that that is the first time since the convention was drafted that we've had a prime minister that has attacked the convention. It's one thing to attack the Human Rights Act or attack the Strasbourg Court or attack the individual decisions. 
But to attack that convention, that post-Holocaust thing that binds Europe together on some kind of ethical project, I think is unprecedented and very frightening. Um, I hope that she recognises that there is benefit in signing up to these international treaties, both diplomatically, to set an example, and also in the hope that then she and her government will be held to those standards. But I, I think there is reason to be fearful that Theresa May doesn't believe in international obligations. The gentleman, uh, we're, we're getting down to the end. The gentleman here and the lady in the middle, and I think it's just going to have to be two. I'm really sorry for those who haven't caught my eye successfully. Uh, the lady in the middle, you put your hand up, right? And you, sir. And these will need to be pretty short, I think, if we're going to finish on time. Sir. Uh, thanks for a great talk. Uh, my name is Adam. Um, I was reading up uh, this week in the light of the furore about uh, middle-aged men pretending to be children just so they can get into the country. I was reading up about sports organisations that have had, they've been wrestling with this issue for quite a few years of people, for example, pretending to be younger than they are so they can play in a certain football tournament. And they've developed quite sophisticated protocols for ageing people. One of them is, I think, an MRI scan of the wrist bones because the density of the bone in the MRI scanner can be shown related to age. Right. So I, I'm wondering what are your views on perhaps using these more sophisticated methods so that the children who really are children get the help they need and the, the fakers don't. Very interesting, Alan. And could you put your hand up again so people can see you? And the microphone is being moved towards you now. And you have it. Excuse me. Where you go? It's a failed microphone. That's why we have a number of microphones. Let's try this one. Hi. Throw the other one away. Get it back. Is it working? Um, anyway, my question is... Who are you? Oh, my name is Adan, and I'm a sixth form student. And my question is, you mentioned that around 60% of the population don't have a proper idea of what the Human Rights Act mm -hmm. actually is. So what do you think we can actually do about this? Can we... I don't know, invest more time to teaching the younger generation about the human rights and the importance of it because it is my generation that will be eventually running the world in some way and we will be facing people like people like me from a black Muslim and of being just being a woman, it's just there's so much hate and hostility in society and it is quite hard to deal with it because there's fear every day about or oh, maybe someone might attack me on the train or someone will just, you know, racially abuse me so my question is what can we do to give people an idea of the significance of the Human Rights Act what can we do to inform people about it because not many people know what the Human Rights Act really is like what is it actually and how can we help people to know more about it that's my question thank you very much I mean an idea last question but we'll hear about Alan's first and then that and then we okay. need to wrap up so age assessment um there's a number of things, I think, to be said about this issue. The first is that I think there needs to be scepticism when some people say immediately, oh, well, I saw someone get off a boat, and I tell you what, he looked 40. I mean, that that is classic kind of oversimplified anecdotal reporting. We don't actually know that a number of what we understand to be genuinely fleeing persecution refugee children are faking and are three times the age they're saying they are. So let's establish that there's a problem first. Then we get onto the question of, do we need to check how old these kids are? Now, that's something that happens all the time. So many of the obligations on local authorities, sorry to be techy about it, but many of the obligations on local authorities are dependent on how old someone is. I have done more cases than I can count where the local authority has assessed a child's age and said we think you're 20 and therefore you're not entitled to the obligation to the resources you would be entitled to if you were 12 and then you end up challenging the age assessment and it's a kind of fraught and complicated area of law which is made up of as you would imagine bits of law bits of expert evidence bits of medical evidence documentary evidence it's all in there um so People are used to grappling with this issue. It's not something that should confound our authorities. I don't think that we need to move to... I mean, there was a suggestion that dentists should be brought in to look at these kids' teeth. And the dentists today, very rightly, in my view, came out and said we are not going to start being used as tools of the government to enforce immigration policy. 
Um, the fact is, is you don't need to embark upon very invasive personal and often medical measures to age people. That, in my view, is an excessive intervention in someone's private life and into someone's physical and moral integrity. But you can still do it to a degree that is perfectly accurate enough for the normal operation of immigration policy. And there should be no difference with trying to deal with, let's face it, the very few refugee children that are actually being brought here. And it may well be that football clubs have to do MRI scans, but that's because football clubs are paying God knows how many millions of pounds every week. And I suspect the people who come here to play football don't mind the MRI scans being done. But that's just simply not the case when you're talking about governments imposing those kind of measures on what will be some of the most vulnerable children that have ever set foot in this country. Yeah. <laughs> So that's my view on that. Um, yeah, yeah. Oh, I mean, that's enough. Absolutely. That's enough. I'm, I'm done. I've done it. Um, uh, great question. What can we do? Million dollar question. Glad to hear you think you might one day be running the world. I think that's a good aspiration. Um, and I think it is right that there is a big knowledge gap in relation to the Human Rights Act in particular, human rights in general. I think one thing, the obvious thing, is that it should be a central part of the curriculum. And I think whether you teach it as part of citizenship or as part of PSHE, or whether you try and thread it through history and English literature and philosophy and religious studies, however you do it, there needs to be a thoughtful way of talking about human rights to young people. And I don't think that that currently exists in a meaningful way. Um, I think also everyone in this room, everyone you know, has an obligation when someone makes a throwaway comment in the pub, or you're probably not enough to go to the pub, we're a cafe, um, <laughs> then, <laughs> then you should challenge it and do your best to explain why it is that human rights mean something to you. Um, you can join Liberty, I think that'll help. <laughs> and I think, I think it is about, like I said before, it's about being open to having these conversations, understanding that they're complicated, understanding that emotions might run quite high on some of these issues, but being safe in the knowledge that we can have the conversation at all and I think you shouldn't be ashamed to bring your own experience into that conversation I did a thing the other week it was the international day of the girl and I did a mentoring thing um, with some 15 year old girls and amusingly the first question I was asked was what time do you have to get up in the morning for your job um, but anyway they then moved on to more substantive issues and there was one girl who said I don't really like coming into central London because I am a black Muslim woman, black Muslim girl, and I don't feel comfortable here because there are not very many people like me on the streets in central London. I prefer to stay in Bethnal Green. And what followed from that comment was a really quite amazing conversation about human rights and, and why human rights are relevant to everybody and why they might be relevant to her in her own way, differently but equally to how they might be relevant to me. Um, and I think that people owning that sense of values and understanding that they will apply to them differently but that at their core there is something very universal and that you have that in common with the people who sit next to you with me with anyone out on the street that I think is very powerful and I think if you can take the time to have that conversation with people if you do it if everyone in this room does it if everyone in the country does it in the end we'll be fine <laughs> We, we, need, we, need, we need to wrap up. Now, uh, this is like a rite of passage or a trial by ordeal <laughs> for a new director of liberty. And the difficulty with succinctness and why so few people are succinct is it invites further interactions. The normal procedure is to speak till about 25 to 8, to have one question <laughs> and to whitter on in another 15 or 20 minutes and leave. So we have had tremendous discipline from our speaker, for which he has been punished <laughs> by an array of questions of range and complexity, which we're familiar with at LSE, because we know the LSE audience is amazing, but which has been challenging for you for an hour and a half. So I think it was a prodigious performance. Uh, we only talk in terms of exams at LSE, but you would have got a distinction if we'd been marking it. <laughs> now, uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit before you get to uh, thank her in a proper way. There is a theme emerging uh, in, in LSE Law Department. We've got on, 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 on the 1st of November, we've got, uh, do think about coming to these. When the people speak, what do they say? The meaning and boundaries of the popular mandate, 
which is about what the people mean, a lot of the Benedict Anderson stuff, with the leading uh, pollster, John Curtis, and two colleagues, Shauna and Catherine. Uh, and then hauntingly, on the 7th of November, that's a week after, we have Philippe Sands. I say hauntingly. Philippe's written a fantastic book called East West Street uh, about uh, the atrocities of Hitler's Third Reich. And people, I mean, obviously, it's an extreme uh, story, a brilliantly told story by Philippe. Uh, and, but, I mean, there are, there are echoes of earlier phases in speeches like that of Amber Rudd at the Conservative Party conference. And it's not a, an analogy we use easily. But I think, speaking uh, honestly, and in, uh, I think things have really changed in this country. And there is a cultural war going on, to be honest with you. I think it's not the normal politics. And they might lose, but they have to lose. It's not normal. Uh, I was interested in your balance right at the start. I was going to pick you up about it. It's, it's something which any of us who are concerned with human rights and freedom and liberty should care about. Now, the third event I'll gloss over, but it's me. <laughs> trying to, it's me trying to sell a book. And I put, I'll put you under enormous pressure to do so. If you come, I might as well warn you, on the 8th of December... And it's called uh, Human Rights After Brexit, still on Fantasy Island. I've written a book called On Fantasy Island. Uh, now, uh, so that's on the 8th of December. The other's in November. Do try and come if you can. Uh, the last question was brilliant. And the answer reminded us that human rights, the Human Rights Act is not just law, though it is law. The Human Rights Act has become an important battleground in what I've just described as a cultural war. So its retention matters more than any of the specifics of the cases under it. And this war has not been initiated by the Human Rights Act protagonists. It has been deliberately initiated by people who want to change this country. And uh, I speak as a person who is regarded as a bargaining chip in a negotiation with Europe, as many in the, this room will be. Now, Shami Chakrabarti, the well-known uh, predecessor of Martha, took on the liberty just around the time of 11 September 2001. And that became the defining feature. Well, I think, Martha, if I may say so, this topic and Brexit and how we manage liberty and human rights in a country in which a group want to plunge inwards back to a period of deplorable conduct of the type we've had described by some people here. Liberty and you have come at this moment to maybe define an important part of the battle against. And I think it was fantastic for us to hear you today and to hear you with the space to develop your ideas and the excellence of the questions producing tremendous responses in addition to the paper speech. So as we wrap up, can we just thank Martha for coming and for giving us such a brilliant presentation. Thank you, Martha. <laughs>